transcription. Barry Craig, confidential investigator, starring William Gargan. Barry Craig speaking. Detectives come in three sizes. City cops, big agencies, and guys like me with a small office and an insurance company retainer to pay the rent. Cops don't have to worry about getting cases, and the big agencies have branches from here to Shanghai. But from where I sit, you never can tell where your next case will come from. Last week, it started with my old brown suit. I'd been on a bodyguard case, and the suit looked as if I'd been sleeping in it for a week. There was a good reason for that. I had. I tucked it under one elbow and ducked into George the Taylor's. George had a king-size shoebox in the basement of my office building. Morning, Mr. Craig. Hi, George. What can you do with this suit? <laughs> if you like herringbone handkerchiefs, I could maybe salvage enough goods. All right, so I'm not Adolf Monju. How about it? Tuesday? With the spots out, Thursday. Okay, Thursday. <laughs> Oh, say, uh, Mr. Craig, I-, I wanted to ask you. I've got a problem. Well, what is it, George? Got a pair of plaid slacks with no coat to match? No, no, no. I- I- I'm serious. My wife says, George, you go to the police. But she wasn't here when that man came. What man? What's the pitch, George? The man said I need protection. Shakedown, huh? The man said I've got to pay $50 a week to stay open. He says, George, you wouldn't want trouble. Maybe a bottle of acid spilled on your racks. Did you pay him? Well, I didn't have $50. I told him to get out. Now, I'm scared, Mr. Craig. Look, you're a detective. I want to hire you. You protect me. That won't work, George. Stopping a protection racket is a big operation. You need 24-hour guards, the whole setup to protect all the shop doors. Well, I-, I could pay in installments. You've already paid for protection, George. Your taxes. You better call in the cops. They're the only ones who can swing it. Oh, no. He said they'd beat me up. Maybe kill me. Look, George, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll drop in at headquarters tomorrow and bend the lieutenant's ear. He'll give orders for a cop from the precinct to look after you. And start the ball rolling to find out who's behind this racket. Will you really do that for me, Mr. Craig? Sure, sure. After all, I wouldn't want anything to happen to my brown suit. George disappeared in the spritz of steam, and I headed home. I put in a call to Lieutenant Edwards. He was out, so I left a message that I'd call in the morning. I was propped up in bed eating pretzels, reading a medium hard-boiled private eye opus, wondering where he found all the beautiful blondes with the low-cut problems when the phone rang. I left the intrepid uh, sleuth under a falling blackjack and stretched for the receiver. Craig speaking. Mr. Craig, you've got to come quick. George? You've got to come down right away, Mr. Craig. Please, please. What's up? Somebody there? Hello, George. George. Hello, George. I slid into my shoes and took off across town. When I hit the pavement outside of George's shop, I had company. A hook and ladder, two pump engines, and a crowd of fire buffs who traveled to Denver to see a lit can of Sterno. The smoke was pouring out of the cellar as I muscled my way through the police lines and ran into Lieutenant Edwards. What do you want to be when you grow up, Craig? A cop or a fireman? I'll take a rain check on the lap, Lieutenant. What are you doing here? Just holding back the crowd. If you ask me, all these fire buffs are nuts. Anybody know what started the fire? Doubt it. Cleaner stores go up like birthday candles all the time. What does George say? Who? George, the tailor. He runs the shop. Probably at home playing three-handed stuff. No, no. He lives in back of the shop. He called me from here. You sure he isn't around? Haven't seen him. Fire boys said the joint was clean. Maybe. We better find out. Hey, where you going? Inside. It's chilly out here. I grabbed a rubber chest to from the hook and ladder and headed inside. The first flash had died down and the shop was burning nicely at the proper temperature for browning a turkey quickly. Under the fireman's coat, I was beginning to base in my own juice as I pushed into the back room. I found what I was looking for under the counter. George the tailor, dead. I carried him outside and knocked off a few minutes to pump the smoke out of my lungs and siphon a little oxygen in. You all right, Barry? <coughs> you know where I can get a new pair of eyelashes? Craig, what are you doing sightseeing in a fire at this hour of the night? And how did you know that guy was in there? I told you, Lieutenant. George called me. He was up against the protection grip. He tried to hire me. I told him I'd have you look into it. Well, it's too late for a referral now. Yeah? Well, it looks like it's my baby now. You better give me the whole shooting match to date. I have. That's all I've got. Anything turned up on your end? Any other complaints of a protection shakedown? Not a mutter. You're lucky you're out of it. I'm not. I haven't welched on a client yet, and as far as I'm concerned, George was my client. Well... 
It's a good, clean pro job anyway. Tough to prove arson. Maybe not. I found this wedged under George. Plastic? Celluloid scrap. Comes in real handy. Stick a plumber's candle in a pile of it, and by the time it blazes up, the mechanic is clear to Nutley, New Jersey, to establish his alibi. Celluloid, huh? Well, then I'd better make my call in arson. Yeah, and while you've got the precinct on the wire, just casually mention murder. The bus from Bellevue rolled up, and they loaded George's body in the back. I watched it pull away. Then a hand fell on my shoulder. I turned around slow and found a pair of thick eyeglasses staring right through me. Oh, Mr. Craig, I'm Alfred Whittington. Oh, look out for the lapel. This has just become my only suit. Uh, you're the confidential investigator, aren't you? I've got a license. I want to hire you. I pay rent on an office that's open during business hours. If you don't mind, right now I'm tired and a little burnt around the edges. I overheard your conversation with Lieutenant Edwards. You'll get your ear pinched in a keyhole that way. I'd like to talk to you, Craig. Perhaps my apartment? Perhaps not. Would it interest you if I told you I want to retain a detective to find out who killed George the tailor? Oh, all right, Mr. Whittington, as you say, let's go to your apartment. We rode uptown in the caddy that had to bend to get around corners. The name clicked as we crossed 42nd Street. Alfred P. Whittington. He ran the newspaper that did the big crime series this year. They got Stretch Longo to talk and almost pinned half a dozen rackets on the coattails of Herman Jess, the big operator. Of course, they had to put Longo together with Scotch tape for the funeral, but it made nice reading, and Herman Jess had left town until it all blew over. Whittington's apartment was in the penthouse on top of the newspaper building. We sailed up in a private lift and waded through the nap to his library. It was the kind of a room you see behind the iron gray hair and the whiskey ad. Whittington was a little cozy about speaking his piece, so we discussed interior decoration till he got ready to make the plunge. I, uh, I had this room specially designed for my hobbies. Oh, looks like you make a hobby of hobbies. Guns, original oil paintings, and that fish tank is big enough for a stunted whale. Oh, uh, that isn't all. I've got movie editing equipment in those cabinets, color slide projector. I'm very interested in photography. All you need is an erector set. Look, Mr. Whittington, I'm not writing an article for House Beautiful magazine. Of course, I, uh, I just like to get to know a man before I talk business. With me, it's the other way around, so let's have it. You uh, know, of course, the paper's been running a series on crime in the city. The board of directors is very anxious to continue. They've so instructed me. Where do I fit in? I heard you say you were going to work on this protection racket. That's right. Do you uh, still intend to? Up to the top. Good, good. We can help each other, Craig. I want to retain you on behalf of the paper. What happened to your reporters? Measles? Contrary to popular fiction, reporters aren't trained as detectives. You are. What do you want? Whatever you can get. Of course, I want reports direct to me, strictly confidential. That comes with the price of the entree. Our legal staff will have to go over everything before we print it. And nobody's to know you're working for me. Bashful? Discreet. The staff here would feel I didn't have confidence in them. Don't you? When I want a job done right, I go to a professional. I want the truth, no matter whom it involves. But I want the story exclusive, as it develops, step by step. All right. Then you're my second client, because George the Taylor comes first. Next morning, I went down to the insurance company that pays me that nice, steady retainer, rain or shine. I waited through the acre of desks in the outer office and rapped on the glass door marked Arthur B. Goldsmith. Art was the company expert on fires. He knew enough angles on arson to burn out an asbestos mine. I planted the scrap of celluloid I found under George the Taylor on his desk and flipped over a few questions. No soap, Barry. Celluloid is standard equipment. It doesn't point to anybody? It'd be like asking which ball player uses a bat. The mechanic plants a plumber's candle in the celluloid scrap, down she burns, and then they can file the insurance claim in the morning. Much doing these days? Average. Not like in the Depression. In 33, the only way to make a profit was burn your own place down every six months. Art, if you wanted to hire the best, money no object, uh, who would you get to start a nice, cozy conflagration? Pro job? Major League. Let's see. Mike DiGiorno is in Elmira. Maybe uh, Irving Turkle, celluloid Harry Bush. I'll give you a list, maybe ten men. Thanks, Art. It's a long shot. Got something else? Not yet, but if you rake a red-headed clinker out of the next fire, that's me. I started checking down Art's list. It was like looking for the clams and a bowl of cheap chowder. Two of them were at peace in the lower bay, hugging a load of bricks. I found Irving Turkle on Center Street, right opposite police headquarters, pushing a baby carriage full of hot charcoal and roasted chestnuts. 
Hot roasted chestnuts. All hot. Uh, Dansworth, Turco. Who are you? Barry Craig. Hot goldsmith at Federal Indemnity put me on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why, I got a lot of respect for Mr. Goldsmith. I a lot, a lot, of, a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. Here's your chestnut. Thanks. Look out for worms. Yeah, I will. How's business, Turco? You push ice cream, turns cold. Switch to chestnuts, you fry an egg in the sidewalk. Tough, huh? My worst enemy should have it better. You haven't been roasting anything besides chestnuts lately? <laughs> like, like what? Like tailor shops? Oh, Mr. Craig, I, I'm telling you honest, I ain't so much as set fire to cigarettes since the last time I got sprung. Sure. Look, look, I, I, I ain't so young no more. You, you could get pneumonia standing out here, but inside those cell blocks, it ain't so nice neither. I ought to know. I, I've been in maybe 18 years since I was, I was 13. Warwick, Myra, Clinton, I've been them all. Enough already. I made up my mind I want to die on the... <coughs> out. <coughs> Could you use five, Turkle? Oh, you're, you're kidding. I want to find a mechanic who did a job on the west side yesterday. A tailor shop? You know about it? I read it in the paper. I got a list from Art Goldsmith. Save me some time and it's worth a thin. Uh, me, me, Mr. Goldsmith... Should not have put me on the list. I, I retired. I, I wouldn't. How about do... the rest of them? Well, I, I heard somebody the other day saying Harry Bush made a good connection. Where can I find him? Oh, I, uh, look, Mister Craig, I'm, I'm, I'm on my own now. There, there wouldn't nobody even feel bad if I got took. I'll cover you, Turco. All right. Harry Bush has got a drop in Long Island City. Easy glide roller skating rink. All right, Turgo. Thanks a lot. You you tell Mr. Goldsmith I'm retired. You tell him that. I, I got a lot of respect for Mr. Goldsmith. Excuse me, I uh, I gotta get back to work. Chestnuts. Hot roasted chestnuts. <laughs> the easy glide roller skating rink was in a factory district across the river in Queens. It was an oversized barn with high school kids on wheels where the cows should be. I managed to collide with a redhead in a turtleneck sweater and one of those velvet skating skirts that look like the paper panties on a lamb chop, and she told me where to look for Harry Bush. There was a sign on the door that said, Manager, keep out, but I decided to overlook it. Who's that? Hello, Harry. If you want to rent skates, you're in the wrong pew. Mind if I smoke? Who are you? We got a light, a match, maybe a plumber's candle. What are you, a cop? Private license, Barry Craig. A nice drop you've got here, Harry. What are you talking about? I'm the manager of this Been place. to any good fires lately? What would I be doing at a fire? Lighting it. They say around town, celluloid Harry Bush is working again. You're in the protection racket up to your pointy ears. You're crazy, Craig. I haven't been near a tailor shop. Yeah? I didn't mention any names, Harry. I just said protection. How did you happen to think of tailor shops? I read about it in this morning's paper. They're still burning people for murder in this state, Harry. But then you won't mind. You like fire. I wouldn't even get booked. Listen, Craig, I don't care what you think. It ain't going to do you no good. Somebody covering for you, Harry? What do you think? Who is it? Why don't you find out? Maybe I will. So long, fireflies. Outside, I parked my shoulders against the wall just around the corner and went into a trance. I didn't have long to wait. Celluloid Harry came bouncing out in less than five minutes and headed to town. I stuck with him like bubble gum till he ducked into a doorway in the East 60. I gave him a running start, and I waltzed in in time to see the indicator on the elevator hit five. I ran a finger down the directory. There were only two offices on five. A Dr. Martin Podulik, a DDS, and an outfit named Star Enterprises that could stand for anything. I grabbed the elevator on the next bounce and punched the button marked five. I put my shoulder to the door, Mark Star Enterprises, and he. What? What's the idea? Well, Herman Jess, I presume. I didn't know you were back. Who the devil are you? Where's Sergeant Lord Harry? Who? A little spark plug. He came up here. Well, I have enough trouble without guessing games. Who are you? Barry Craig. You're not police. Private. Now, you can't break in here like this. I'm not a well man. I should be in Florida right now. What's keeping you? Well, that's my business. Yeah, I know about your business. You're really a public benefactor, Herman. 
Where would a kid get a reefer without you, huh? Yeah. Now, look, now, look, the doctor said I shouldn't get excited now. That must be a handicap in running your racket. I'm not in rackets anymore. I, I'm retired. What makes you think I'm going to believe that? Now, does it look like I'm running a business here? Well, no, but... I've got uh, no desk, no files, not even a telephone. Now, the doctor says I've got to have absolute quiet. All right, then. Just tell me where celluloid Harry is, and I'll stop disturbing the peace. Now, now look, Craig, you, you want some somebody named Harry. I haven't got him. There's only one door here, and you came through it. Now, take a quick look in the closet and walk out of here. My heart can take just so much. And... I'll take you up on that, Jess. Oh. Now, kindly leave. Okay, okay, Jess. But if you haven't quit the rackets, I'm warning you now. I'm after the mechanic that burned George the tailor and the man who bought him. Clear up to the top. Put that in your blood pressure and smoke it. I started for the door with a sinking feeling that I was a sucker in a new style shell game. Celluloid Harry had to be in Jess's office. Unless he was under the rug, I couldn't see him. The elevator door was just sliding closed as I reached it. I got a quick shot of a pretty picture. Celluloid Harry with his finger on the first floor button. The door slammed and I stared at the arrow as it swung around. It didn't add up. It wasn't in Jess's office. The only other room on the floor was a dentist. I decided to develop a toothache. Can I help you? Yes, my tooth. Uh, this one, see? Hmm? Hurts something awful. Oh. Dr. Weiss is on the first floor, and Dr. Carey on the third. What's the matter with Dr. Padulik? I'm sorry. He isn't in today. How about the fellow just came out? There's been nobody here. Then I guess I made a mistake. By the way, you like roller skating? I beg your pardon? Nothing. A book of matches on your desk says Easy Glide Roller Rink. I thought maybe you liked to skate. <laughs> That dentist setup smelled like a herring factory at high noon in July, but I didn't push the point. I left and found a phone booth in the lobby of the building and poured my story into Whittington's shell-like ears. There might be any number of reasons for that girl lying to you, Craig. Harry might be a boyfriend. She doesn't like to skate, and Herman Jess is right next door. I think the dentist's office is a blind. You think he's fronting for Jess? I'd lay the odds. When the crowd thins out, I'm going up there to check. Well, what do you expect to find? I figure with the rackets Jess is running, he's got to have complete records handy or he couldn't keep track of the take. I want to find those records. All right. If you come across anything, bring it straight to me. The receptionist had left for lunch, so I rang a few peels on the bell to see if Dr. Padulik was at home. He wasn't, so I let myself in with a bobby pin and went to work on the desk in the inner room. I pulled out a stack of records. That latest date was three months ago. The appointment book past that date was blank. The bills checked. Nothing later than three months ago, except the last one. A bill from the Conmont Memorial Home for $700.84 for the funeral of Martin Perdulic. What are you doing in here? Huh? Who are you? Who do you think I am? Dr. Martin Perdulic. He was a rabbity gray little man. Looked pretty good for a three-month corpse. There was a vein in his forehead jumping like a kid on a pogo stick. But his hand was steady as a rock as it was wrapped around a thirty-eight revolver. You stay where you are. What do you think you're going to do? I... Well, you broke into my office. I'm going to call the police. Fine, fine. You go ahead. Maybe you can explain to them how you happened to be buried three months ago. What? You're no dentist. You're fronting for Herman Jess. Well, then, you're crazy. Am I? I'll save you time. I'll call the police. Give me that spoon. And you give me that gun. There. Fair trade. Now, settle down, friend, while I jam a chair under the doorknob. I'm going to look for Herman Jess's record. I was in a tough spot, and I knew it. The license commission doesn't look kindly on breaking and entering, and if that office was clean, I was in for trouble. I knew I couldn't search that room for anything smaller than an elephant in the few minutes before somebody drifted in, so I kept one eye on my buddy and played it cozy. I yanked the desk drawers out and threw the papers around like a picnic. I pulled the medical books down off the shelves to make sure that there weren't any false fronts. I wasn't getting any tape from the phony dentist, so I headed for the other room. I dumped the instrument trays, and he couldn't have cared less. And when I headed for the file cabinet in the corner, the vein in the forehead beat like a ragtime drummer on bathtub gin. You can't get away with this. I'll, I'll have you in jail. Yeah, yeah. 
slid open the file drawers. Nothing but dental records. I slammed it shut and my playmate relaxed like a hangover in a Turkish bath. I couldn't figure it. Those records ought to be near that file cabinet. Maybe a secret panel. I couldn't be sure without an x-ray and then I got it. What are you doing? Taking a look in this box on top of the file. Those are valuable x-rays. Don't get them out of order. Hmm. I won't. I'm taking them with me. This first batch are teeth, all right. But from here on, these pictures didn't come from anybody's mouth. Not unless his molars kept double-entry books. Oh, company. Let me in. I know you're in there, Craig. Not for long. Which way is the nearest fire escape? Hurry! I've got him! In the pig's eye, Frank! Oh, 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 oh. Craig, stand still or I shoot. The window was locked, so I tossed the waste paper basket through it. I was two floors down the fire escape when Jess showed up in the window. Jeff was slamming around like a pinball game with body English. I hit the ground and sprinted for the curb. Then I jumped into a waiting hack. To pull the way, I saw a celluloid Harry bounce out of the building and into another cab. Hey, mister, I wouldn't want to make you nervous, but you're being followed. No, I'm very popular. Can you lose them? I uh, know. My life insurance lapsed last week. Would 50 bucks change your mind? What good is insurance after I'm dead? Fifty I can spend now. Hold on to your plate. We weaseled through Manhattan. The cab behind us stuck like a mustard plaster. We got into a jam and a transverse across Central Park. Hang on, mister. I'm going to cut inside that bus on the sidewalk. You got caught by the lights. Shot straight up to Whittington's mint line sewer. He was showing himself color shots with his copper spaniel on the slide projector when I walked in. Craig, you didn't bring? Doorbells are for process service. I've got Herman Jess and the protection racket in my pocket. Here. What are these? Dental x-ray films. Only there isn't an inlay in the bunch. These are Jess's records. Microfilm to match the teeth x-rays. Are you sure? You can't read them without a magnifying widget. But I'll bet there's enough in that envelope to send Jess up the river like salmon. Shall I call the cops? I'll take care of that, Craig. Wait. You expecting anybody up here tonight? Uh, no, I left orders not to be disturbed. In that case, we'd better get ready to receive company. Somebody's coming up the stairs. I thought I lost Harry, but I guess he's stuck. Chuck that envelope in the fish tank. What's up? Go ahead. It won't hurt the film. Now, I'll try to look in it. All right, Craig. Get him up. We were just talking about you, Jess. Was your nose itching? You hoist him too, Whittingham. You can't get away with this, Jess. I'll have you... You won't do anything. They're pretty brave in those crusading editorials. Wreck my health. Let's see you stand up against the gun. Craig, do something. You got me suggestions. And I want those records this, this fun's brain stole from me. You got me wrong, Jess. Shall I work on them? No, no. I'll try Whittington. What are you going to do? Harry, ask him where those records are. You get away from me. You heard, Mr. Jess. Where are the records? I don't know. Hey! Don't move, Craig. Ask him again, Harry. Come on, Whittington. Where are they? I don't know, I told you. Let me alone. Listen, Jeff. Don't move. I'm a very nervous man. It would be very bad for me to shoot you. Now you got anything to say? No. No, not when you put it that way. Okay, Harry, go ahead. All right, Whittington. No, no, don't hit me again. No, don't. Where are those records? No, no, not again. There, in the fish tank. Craig hid them there. Harry. I got them. Look inside. It films all right. All right, we're getting out of here. Come on, Harry. What's that? Mr. Whittington is having open house. What are you talking about, Craig? I think the boys in blue are coming to tea. A cop. He's bluffing. Care to wait and see? Get the back door, Harry. We don't want trouble on the way out. Take care of Craig. A pleasure. <laughs> Harry was behind me when he let me have it with the butt end of his gun. I retired temporarily from this world, and when I got back, I was looking at a pair of shoulders four yards wide with Lieutenant Buck Edwards cooing gently in my ear. Craig, Craig, you all right? Oh. I'd better send for a doctor. How about Jess? Dad is yesterday's racing for me. Tried to shoot it out with the boys I had staked downstairs. And celluloid Harry's on his way to prison ward at Bellevue. Just did, eh? Uh, Lieutenant, uh, did you search the body? There was certain evidence. You mean this envelope? That belongs to the paper, Lieutenant part of a confidential report. I don't know, Mr. Whittington. I'll uh, take complete responsibility. We rate a break on this story. Craig was retained by us. Go ahead, Buck. Give it to him. Excellent. Excellent. I'll put it in my safe. Better look at it first. What do you mean? You'll find it's a real classy collection of diseased choppers. What are you talking about? 
They aren't the real microfilm records. They're just a bunch of legitimate x-rays of teeth. I left the real records with the cab driver and told him to take him to Lieutenant Edwards. What you told me... Sure I did. But I like to play it safe. I knew Jeff would be after me, and I was afraid he might persuade you to give him back. I... I'm sorry. I'm afraid I was rather weak. But I really thought he intended to kill us. Oh, don't apologize. You were terrific. That was a great strong-arm scene you played with your stooges. Stooges? Sure. Why do you think I ducked those records, Whittington? When I was going through that x-ray file, one thing caught my eye. A color transparency. It didn't exactly belong in that file because I'd seen a print of that picture before on your desk. A very flattering portrait of your wife. My wife? Yes, you made a slight mistake. You must have got it mixed up with your microfilm records when you shipped them back to your boy, Herman Jess. Oh, see here. Are you trying to insinuate that I... I... mean, you're the real boss behind this record, not Harry Jess. Why, well, that's absurd. If that were true, then why would I have hired you? Self-protection. Your board of directors was pushing you to deliver that crime series, but you figured that if I turned anything up, it'd be easy to take care of me this way. Craig, you're out of your mind. You can't prove a thing. Oh, yes, we can. We checked those microfilms, Mr. Whittington. There's a payoff to you listed on every page. You've been under arrest for the last five minutes. Well, Whittington, I guess this squares accounts for George the Taylor, but you still owe me for one brown suit. I'll put it on the bill for services rendered. Oh, take him away, boys. Coming, Barry. Coming, Lieutenant. So long, folks. See you next week. You have just heard Barry Craig, confidential investigator, starring William Gargan. Next week, another exciting transcribed story starring America's number one detective, William Gargan, as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story was written by Ernest Kennard and featured Santa Sortega in the role of Alfred Whittington. Your announcer is Don Pardo. All persons and places mentioned in this program were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Till we meet again next Wednesday for another hard-hitting adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator, let me give you a brief rundown of the adventure shows you can hear on NBC. Tomorrow night on NBC, there are a trio of action programs starting off with Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, as he investigates another thrilling mystery. Then Dragnet brings you an authentic criminal case history as taken from the files of the Los Angeles police. Later, counter-spy is called in to solve a case which threatens to endanger our national security. Then on Saturday, screen actor Brian Dunleavy takes you down the shadow-filled corridors of mystery on another dangerous assignment. On Sunday, NBC's adventure shows include a spine-tingling visit with Martin Kane, Private Eye, followed by the exciting story of The Whisperer. Later, Douglas Fairbanks is featured in The Silent Men with authentic action stories about your government security agents. On Monday, Herbert Marshall comes to the NBC microphone to assume the mysterious identity of the man called X. Then Tuesday night, here Big Town, and another pulse-quickening story is told by editor Steve Wilson of the Illustrated Press. Well, there you have a complete roundup of the top mystery shows you can hear on NBC. Next Wednesday night, we hope you'll be back with us for another adventure with William Gargan as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Now it's Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC.